Welcome to Unpacking Peanuts, the podcast where three cartoonists take an in-depth look at the greatest comic strip of all time, Peanuts by Charles M. Schultz. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. It's Unpacking Peanuts, and we're talking about 1960. Uh, Another high watermark in a series of high watermarks uh, for our hero, Charles M. Schultz. Uh, I'm Jimmy Gownley. I'm one of your hosts for this evening. Uh, You might know me from my comic book series, Amelia Rules, or my graphic novels, The Dumbest Idea Ever, or Seven Good Reasons Not to Grow Up, which are on sale now. Joining me, as always, are my co-hosts. He's a playwright, a composer, both for the band Complicated People, as well as for this very podcast. He is the original editor of Amelia Rules, the co-creator of the original comic book prize guide, the Argosy Prize Guide, as well as the cartoonist behind such great strips as Strange Attractors, A Gathering of Spells, and Tangled River, Michael Cohen. Hey there. And he is the executive producer and writer of Mystery Science Theater 3000, as well as a former vice president for Archie Comics. And currently he is creating the Instagram strip Sweetest Beasts, Harold Buckholz. Hello. Well, guys, we are doing 1960. We just uh, wrapped up uh, last episode with a, with a real watershed moment with happiness as a warm puppy. And uh, we, got a, we got a bunch more strips to get to this year. So if it's okay with you guys, uh, how about we just get started? Great. Sure. May 11th. Charlie Brown is in manager mode. He's lecturing to his team who we do not see. They are off panel. In front of him walks Snoopy. Charlie Brown says, This season we're going to emphasize speed. And Snoopy zips right across in front of him. We're going to have a real running team. We're going to steal bases and steal more bases. Run, run, run. Snoopy zips by the other way, causing Charlie Brown to notice him. Then Charlie Brown continues yelling at the team, saying, We're going to be the runningest team in the league. It's going to be go, go, go. It's going to, at this point, Snoopy is starting to spin circles around Charlie Brown. In the last panel, Snoopy bursts into his classic happy dance, and Charlie Brown says, I can't stand it. The thing about Schultz is he was so consistently brilliant that it just overshadows any other cartoonist. There are very few strips where it seems like he's he's fundamentally doing something wrong. He's trying something new. It's not working. And I think this is one of them. And you'd pretty much have to look at this on Go Comics to see what he's doing. He's been pretty innovative in uh, depicting motion. Uh, You know, people jumping and dashing around. He's tried all kinds of things. He tried something new on this strip. And to me, it doesn't work. And it's just confusing. If you go look at it, you'll see in panel three, Jimmy said Snoopy's running around him. Well, he does this by showing a Snoopy on the left from a front view and a Snoopy on the right in a back view with a little motion line between them, which is kind of understandable. Uh, It's comprehensible what's happening. But the last panel, he has two Snoopy's dancing, one on the left, one on the right, to imply that Snoopy is dancing around in circles, but it doesn't read that way. It reads like all of a sudden there's two Snoopies and one of them looks like he's got a mustache or something. (laughs) It's just like (laughs) you look at it and you go, who is it? That's Snoopy's brother. Who's that other Snoopy there? Anyway, this is, I pick one per year, which I think not, not quite hitting the home run on this one. And this is the one. What I think it, is is that the two it's panel three and four in sequence right because you understand in panel one you understand he's moving right and panel two obviously he's moving left now you make the leap of logic in panel three that oh we're seeing him spin around charlie brown right but then to go from that panel to panel four where the figures of snoopy are in the relatively the same positions in space around Charlie Brown, but just making a different gesture. It doesn't seem like they're still spinning and just moving differently. It seems like they were in the same position as last panel and just raising their hands. Yeah. And I, is that, and I think that's why it makes it look like two instead of one. Yeah, and the motion lines 
don't really tell you anything about the movement. On the fourth one? Yeah, on the fourth one. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's not as clean clear as the the third panel. Yeah. I remember my just my first impression when I was reading this uh you know for the first time uh a couple weeks ago. I was admiring it. I, I I was really enjoying it. Um, it worked for me. But I see what you're saying. The, um, the idea that in the fourth panel they are in the same position. The other thing about this is uh, Snoopy's wearing a baseball cap, and uh, in the famous Snoopy Happy Dance, he's got his snout in the air, his nose is perched on top of his little balloon balloon head. Schultz does not choose to redraw the backside of Snoopy as he's going around Charlie Brown in the circle. In this one, the uh, the baseball cap is on top of his head. So you also have to accept that Snoopy had his nose straight up in the air, and now he's looking straight forward on the right-hand side version of Snoopy. So he didn't do that in panel three. He's changing the rules on himself in panel four. Yeah. Uh, probably because whatever... <laughs> Whenever he tried to draw it with the baseball cap floating on the back side of the head with the nose straight up, it probably just didn't read. And Schultz was so much about something reading, even if it doesn't follow the, the rules of, you know, staying on model with the character or whatever. And Michael's right that uh, the last panel, uh, the Snoopy on the far right, between the hat on his head and the way the uh, the ears are out at an angle, it does look like he's wearing a false mustache or something <laughs> like that. It, it's, it's such an abstract thing to even make a, a dog out of Snoopy dancing. Like you really have to know what Snoopy is. I think before you even can register that as a dog dancing. And I don't know that I have a better solution to how, uh, what do you, do you guys have a better solution to how he could have, um... well, we're going to, in a well, like five or six strips down from here, we have a Schultz also trying to do, really an innovative way of doing motion. And uh, that to me is totally successful. Could it apply back here or is it just not serving what this strip is trying to do? Well, it's Linus and Snoopy tumbling around fighting over the blanket. <laughs> yeah. I mean, give, give the guy a break, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm ending the podcast after this. He blew it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly not as disturbing as the, the dog copter or whatever it was. Well, you know what I think is funny too, is that it, this goes back to the fact that we are just looking at it in such microscopic detail. You'd look at this in a comic strip in a newspaper in 1960 and you wouldn't think about it again. Right. So it probably it's like down and dirty. It gets it done. Yeah. I, I, I can't think of a better solution to accomplish what right. he's trying to accomplish than what he did, except maybe possibly, continue the the little motion lines the way he did in the third panel where he erases part of charlie brown's pants and legs so that it's clear that there's a motion line going around he kind of switches that up to i think less success in the fourth panel well do that in the fourth panel and then either move the position of the two snoopies in the third panel or relate or, or erase one snoopy and just have them be the two snoopies with a strong motion line in the last panel yeah, that's that's tough. Cause yeah, let's edit. Let's edit it. Let's go back I, in and redraw it. Uh, it's it's a shame that he didn't have us. Uh, yeah, could have been something. <laughs> it could have been so much better. <laughs> oh my God, Sparky! Sorry, yeah. if only we were there. This this, this <laughs> is the best solution as I that I can think of. I think, but maybe it, it was asking too much to do in a little single panel. I don't know. May sixteenth. Lucy and Patty are sitting on the bench at a baseball game. Lucy is covering her eyes, and she says, I can't look. Patty is looking intently, though, and she says, the score is three to two in the last of the ninth. Lucy desperately looks at Patty and says, but we have two outs. Patty, with a smile on her face, says, but Charlie Brown is on third, and our best hitter is coming up. Lucy says, say, you don't think Charlie Brown will try to steal home, do you? Patty says, never. Not even Charlie Brown would do anything that stupid. And in the fourth panel, we see Charlie Brown standing on third, saying, I wonder if I should try to steal home. <laughs> this is um, the lead off to a really long sequence. And it's a great sequence. We're only going to look at the first one. I do have a couple of questions about this. See, Schultz is not concerned with the continuity of the baseball team. Right. I mean, they're losing 17,000 to one. 
<laughs> and how did they get to three to two? I have no idea. <laughs> My second question is, how did Charlie Brown get on third? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm tossing this up to um, to the panel. Uh, who's the best hitter? Who's on deck? Uh, Snoopy. You think so? That's my, my, it's either Snoopy or Linus, right? Because we've seen Linus hit well, and Snoopy can, is Snoopy, right? Yeah, I don't know. We have to go, go check some batting averages here. <laughs> well, here's how I think Charlie Brown got to third. I think he was hit by a pitch, <laughs> and then the batter or the pitcher walked the next two batters. <laughs> That's the only way I can conceivably understand Charlie Brown getting on third. Yeah. Anyway, the the sequence is great. And this leads up to, again, his total humiliation, which goes on forever to the point where he can no longer sleep at night without someone coming into his room screaming at him. Why did you do it? I do recommend everybody go on uh, gocomics.com, type in peanuts in the search, and uh, you could go by date. Again, we're in 1960 here, and you can just read along and, and read all of those because they're really good. And as as we start moving in deeper into the 60s and into the later years of the strip, you're going to find there's a lot more of these little uh, long uh, sequences that really start developing into nice little short stories. And uh, this this is one of them, so you should definitely check this one out. May 26th, Charlie Brown and Shermie are walking outside. Charlie Brown has his head hung low. He says to Shermie. All I wanted to do was be a hero. Charlie Brown in anger kicks a can and says, but do I ever get to be a hero? No, all I ever get to be is a stupid goat. Charlie Brown looks extremely upset in panel three and Shermie consoles him saying, don't be discouraged, Charlie Brown. In this life we live, there are always some bitter pills to be swallowed. Charlie Brown walks away saying, if it's all the same with you, I'd rather not renew my prescription. Hey, is this a, is this a time to look in at the thermometer? Let's check the thermometer, Charlie Brown. Oh, absolutely. All right, let's check it. <laughs> All right, so we're in May and we finally have a Shermy strip. So what what do we think here? What does this what does this say about our pal Shermy? Well, he's certainly a philosophical lad. He's philosophical. He's he's already consoling. Have we said he's consoling? I think we did and then it was removed by my bad record keeping. <laughs> I think this is more philosophical than philosophical. consolation. Right, that's true. Cause yeah, yeah. He's he's contemplating life, right? Yeah. And you get the he's taller than Charlie Brown here, and you get the feeling like he is the older kid in this strip who's got a little little more experience under his belt. Absolutely. Absolutely. So are we going to give it to him? Are we going to say uh this shows uh Shermie being philosophical? Definitely. If we haven't used it before. We have not. So that means that as of 1960, Shermie is, well, first off, he's a history buff. And he is also a philosophical, empathetic, aggressive, compassionate, patient, pedantic, knowledgeable, emotional, good listening, vain, friendly, hypocrite. That's yep. deep. That is that deep. Is take, real characterization. <laughs> take that, Hamlet. <laughs> <laughs> Will I, won't I nonsense. Shermie has no time for that. <laughs> yeah. It's time for a Shermie novelization. <laughs> yeah, like um, they would have those Ender Game books where mm -hmm. uh, they would tell the story from various supporting characters' perspectives. You'd have to show, you know, peanuts from the perspective of Shermie. Yeah, and there has to be some fan fiction where Bella dumps those werewolves and... <laughs> <laughs> and she picks up with Shermy. <laughs> hey, then we could get our whole own franchise gone. <laughs> June 4th. Schroeder and Charlie Brown are standing on the sidewalk. Schroeder says, I guess I won't be seeing you until Monday, Charlie Brown. So have a happy weekend. Schroeder waves as he walks away. Charlie Brown says, thank you. Then there's a panel of silent contemplation before Charlie Brown yells to Schroeder, Incidentally, what is happiness? I don't have much to say about this, except when I read this, I went, oh, my entire sense of humor is based on peanuts. <laughs> you said this exact joke 
a couple weeks ago <laughs> and I didn't know it was from peanuts and I, I didn't, you know didn't know either. It's right. just kind of deep <laughs> ingrained in my system. I'm pretty sure uh, I do, um, you know, I do commercial jobs like Schroeder has to now and again, you have to play three blind mice. And I uh, submitted a comic strip a while back and after it was published, I was starting to think, is that a peanut? <laughs> Did I just steal? And I don't know. I didn't go looking for it, but they're, 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 I think it's 50 50. I may have accidentally swiped a, a peanut. <laughs> yeah, I did a strip. It was a silent, it was just a no dialogue strip with in Sweetest Beasts where the, the two, it was a lion and a little lamb that's following him as they're walking deeper and deeper into these weeds. And then there's a, all of a sudden you see there's a struggle and the lion looks back behind him. You can only see the lion because the, weeds are too high and then the f- final panel is is the lamb um kind of lying relieved on his head with a big smile on his face as as the lion's looking up at it. and uh, i think there is probably a weed strip in peanuts that i found out afterward is really close <laughs> like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah that stuff is just ingrained ingrained and there are 17,897 yeah i mean you'll see instances where schultz rips off schultz and i mean didn't remember that he did the same gag you know 15 years previously oh by the way speaking of of doing the same gags again uh we have a listener who has very kindly gone out of their way and is making a list of the various comic strips that were adapted by Schultz and the team into the animated specials. That's great. So isn't that really cool? Uh, Liz, what's his name? Joshua Stauffer, I believe. Oh, Joshua Stauffer. Oh, okay. From Lancaster, PA. I didn't realize that's who it is. See, all the best people are in PA (laughs) and I went to school in Lancaster. So there you go. So uh, heads up, but we'll be talking about that. I was talking before we started recording with Michael about how we're going to handle the animated uh, stuff. And uh, so we'll use Josh's uh, info when we get to that for sure. June 5th. Lucy is sitting in the living room doing something. She says to herself out loud, Tyrannosaurus Rex, life size, 50 feet long and 20 feet high. Wow. Model size, 16 inches long and 10 inches high. He sure had a lot of bones, she says, as she dumps out the box. And we now understand that she is making a dinosaur model. In the next panel, Linus and Snoopy walk in and watch Lucy do this. Linus says, a dinosaur set? Oh boy, might help you put them together, Lucy? Lucy says, oh, I suppose so. Linus bends low and starts picking up some of the pieces from the puzzle and says, this looks real interesting. There's something about dinosaurs that's fascinating. He picks up two pieces and tries to connect them. He says, let's see now. This toe bone here should connect to this foot bone. He reaches for another piece, saying, "Uh uh-huh, right. And this foot bone here should connect to this ankle bone. Now he looks at Snoopy and they both grin at each other. Linus continues, and the ankle bone connects to the leg bone, right? Now they're dancing. Oh, the ankle bone connects to the leg bone, and the leg bone connects to the thigh bone. They continue to dance and sing. Well, Linus sings anyway. The thigh bone connects to the hip bone, and the hip bone connects to the knee bone. They, he's not following the actual song. So, oh, the knee bone connects to the wrist bone, and the wrist bone connects to the... While they run around dancing and singing, Lucy looks apoplectic in the next to last panel and then in the final panel we see linus and snoopy both being hurled butt over tea kettle out the door while charlie brown looks on wondering what in the world is happening so wait where do people know that song from was that a hit song i don't think it would be a hit song no i think it's an old like spiritual song i absolutely love this is like a perfect strip to me this is starts out with some minor little thing with lucy and and it just builds and builds and builds to this raucous joyous fun time with linus and snoopy getting sillier and sillier uh and then and then uh lose to lucy just being absolutely incensed and and tossing them out the the door in this perfect panel at the end with their they're they're literally flying out the door I love the strip. I remember the strip as a kid. Absolutely loving the strip. It was just so much fun. And it, it takes you somewhere in a very short period of time with a real economy that is absolutely silly and, and happy and 
<laughs> than absolutely hilarious. So yeah, this is this is a great strip. This is my second favorite strip of the year. June 6th. Charlie Brown and Lucy are standing outside on the sidewalk talking. Lucy says, you should start thinking about becoming president, Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown, hands behind his back, contemplates the idea. Not me. I can never become president. Lucy says, sure you could, Charlie Brown, but you have to begin planning for it now. Charlie Brown thinks about it. Maybe you're right, Lucy. Maybe if I begin to study now while I'm young, I can become president someday. Lucy kicks her head back and laughs heartily. You, president? <laughs> June 7th. Lucy and Linus are standing outside talking. Linus asks Lucy, do you think Charlie Brown really could get nominated for president? Lucy, indignant, yells, what do you mean nominated? Don't you know anything? She continues yelling at Linus. First, you have to become a prince. Then you get to be president. Linus, in classic thumb and blanket position, says, it's frightening when I realize how little I really know about governmental affairs. And then we have June 10th. Lucy and Linus again. Linus accusingly says to Lucy, I know why you're so anxious for Charlie Brown to be president. He follows behind her, shouting, I'm smart. I've got it all figured out. I'm smart. You can't fool me. You just want to be first woman. Lucy, indignant with her eyes closed, says, The term is first lady. Linus, looking like he knows Lucy has got him, says, I'm never quite so stupid as when I'm being smart. And then it wraps up on June 11th. Back to Charlie Brown and Lucy outside again. Lucy, thinking it over, says, Maybe I don't need you, Charlie Brown. Why should I settle for being just first lady? Why shouldn't I be president myself? She continues, And then, after I got to be president, it would be only one short step to... And then she screams to the heavens, Queen! Sending Charlie Brown flying backwards. She was born to be queen. <laughs> For sure. She doesn't know very much about um, governmental uh, <laughs> affairs, her own self, it seems, though. Well, you don't have to when you're queen. <laughs> <laughs> or in government. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> this is great. I, I can't remember if this continues further than this. I really like the little short stories that he gets into, and I love... Uh, you know, this is the next step beyond just variations on a theme. I, I really enjoy these. Some of these go on for weeks in, in later years. I, I always like that. How about you guys? Yeah. I mean, this year, he's really developing that form. Can I bring up some more obscure lettering uh, issues? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So one thing that I've noticed after the fact as an adult cartoonist is one of the typical rules of lettering for some whatever reason it's been established that uh, if you start uh if, if you use the word i you put what do you call that the 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 uh, horizontal line above and below the vertical line of the i the serifs i guess you could say when you say i but then when it's in the a word you just put a vertical line and schultz tends to break the rules maybe just because he needs the space where he doesn't put the serifs on the the, the letters but i was just noticing here in the strips um he's kind of going back and forth in the on the june 10th ep, uh, episode he's got a bolded minus going i know why you're so anxious for charlie brown to be president and that's got the serifs and then i'm smart i've got it all figured out i'm smart you can't fool me they don't have it and then and then when you get down to the following day, Lucy is using all serif versions of it. So he's bouncing back and forth. It's just one of those things that I noticed that I had never noticed before. And I don't know if he's not thinking about it because it seems like Schultz thinks about everything he puts into his strip. But he's breaking a rule and then he's following a rule. And It's when he uses the personal pronoun I as a with the, in a contraction. He does not use the serif. Or the crossbar, whatever you call it, on the eye. So there is consistency here. He's just he's yeah. There is there is consistency because it's whenever he uses it as a part of a contraction that it has the crossbars, and if if uh, he uses it as just the pro personal pronoun, he oh, got that backwards. Wow. Yeah, right, 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 right. What an interesting. So yeah, place. when he puts yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. So he is consistent. He has thought this through, and that is his choice. He's uh, that's really interesting. Okay. Well, thank you for clearing it up. <laughs> well, you know, I live but to serve. <laughs> June twelfth. Charlie Brown is standing outside amid a series of abstract shapes. <laughs> <laughs> this one I really encourage you to go to Go Comics uh, or pull out your trusty Fanta Graphics book and look at because we just see a series of all kinds of uh, pen marks that indicate possibly fighting, possibly agitation, possibly some sort of mini tornado. What do they call them? Dirt devils. But then uh, by the third tier, we see that what was actually going on was it was another classic fight between Linus and Snoopy for the blanket which has a brief respite while they both are sort of winded then they look at each other determined each to keep their end of the blanket and then go back into a fighting abstraction this is brilliant but as someone who wasn't familiar with the strip would have no idea what's going on well i think you'd know that the dog is trying to i don't you wouldn't know the well we've seen it before have you ever seen a dog and a kid fighting over a blanket (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think, yes, I think a dog, yeah, because you could have a chew toy with a dog or a, or a towel with a dog or whatever, and they'd have one end and you have the other end and you could pull it. I don't think, what you wouldn't get is the context of Linus, and this is being Linus's security blanket, right? But my gosh, and all, if you weren't familiar with cartooning as a language, the first five panels and then the last panels are half complete and total, uh, you know, just abstract art. Yeah. I would have loved to have seen this one in color. I bet it is in color on Go Comics, but on, in the Fantagraphics books, they publish it all in black and white, which normally I'm for because I love a good, clean, crisp black and white reproduction of a line drawing. Mm, that's good stuff. But uh, every once in a while, I'd like to check out the color, so I'll have to do that D- later. Didn't Fantagraphics uh, later put out just the Sundays in color? As, uh, as, that's as, true, that, but that's a whole separate edition. Okay. Yeah, I think they're called Peanuts Every Sunday, actually, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. July 8th, Snoopy is stalking on his hind legs with his teeth bared. He thinks to himself, here comes the big dinosaur, king of the world. Then we see him standing on his hind legs again, but his teeth are no longer bared. Lucy walks by with a scowl on her face. Snoopy looks up to the sky as if he's just minding his own business. Then in the fourth panel, he's back to his dinosaur ways. Here comes the big dinosaur, king of the world. His arms are too long to do a good dinosaur (laughs) front arm. (laughs) Yeah. No, this is, I think I picked this just because I love the classic Snoopy imitations of animals. And he's doing less this year. Very few. This is actually one of the few. And it's just like one of the first ones where he's doing something and then he stops. And then he's basically the fourth panel is the same as the first. He he did did that a lot, but I don't remember seeing it before. And as we're reading chronologically. Yeah, it's always welcome to see Snoopy the Mimic. I think it's just a fun um, exercise for Schultz as a cartoonist. And I'm always interested in seeing the the way he contorts Snoopy to make him look like his, <laughs> his subject. July 13th. Violet is walking by Snoopy. She says to him, hello, dog. Snoopy looks after Violet and thinks to himself, that's not nice. You should always greet a dog by his name. Snoopy walks away thinking... Not that there's anything wrong with the word dog. And Snoopy is on top of his doghouse and he thinks it's just that one is never quite sure of the implication. This is sort of tying in with my theory from a couple of episodes ago. Which is that Snoopy sort of either identifies or represents sort of repressed uh, minorities in in American society. Yeah, Yeah, that definitely that definitely has that resonance right because okay you're just calling me a dog which i technically am a dog but i don't like the way you're saying it because i don't know what your intentions are Mm -hmm. which i would get which makes total sense right yeah it works yeah 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 it's like calling someone boy yeah right exactly exactly and and it's it's that well it's funny in in racist terms it's called the dog whistle right you say it in a way that you could get plausible deniability that you didn't mean anything by it when in fact you knew exactly what you were saying. Mm-hmm. Cause, and, and that's the case in this strip. I mean, Violet knows it's Snoopy, you know, she might be being forensically correct, but she knows she's being dismissive. Yeah. 
Oh, she does, does she? <laughs> oh, she does. <laughs> July 14th. Lucy presents Linus with a drawing she has made. She says, I've just drawn a cartoon. Look at it and laugh. Linus looks at it and says, I don't think it's very funny. Lucy says, I said, look at it and laugh. Linus. <laughs> Lucy walks away with her drawing and saying, that's the trouble with cartoonists today. They don't make people laugh. <laughs> she also doesn't do a lot of these self-referential things, but this is a good one. Weirdly, I, I buy Lucy as a cartoonist more than Charlie Brown, especially if she's going and demanding laughs from each individual <laughs> listener. Yes. Which, by the way, is going to be my new marketing plan. <laughs> right. So this Lucy as a cartoonist thing goes on for, for a little bit. As it does the next day. July 15th. Lucy is down on her knees, drawing on a piece of paper. Charlie Brown is watching her. Lucy says, I decided to go into political cartooning. She continues, I'm going to ridicule everything. Charlie Brown thoughtfully says, I understand, Lucy. By the use of ridicule, you hope to point up our faults in government and thus improve our way of life. Lucy, hands to the air, says, No, I just want to ridicule everything. This is a good... A good persona for, for Lucy. Oh, for sure. For sure. And this is interesting because, you know, uh, according to Pepper's uh, paradigm, <laughs> Lucy, when she's pointing out her friend's faults, does have their best interest at heart. She really thinks she's making a difference. Here she's found an outlet for just her base instincts. She just can ridicule people. <laughs> One of the great, uh, great things you can do with art. July 31st. Linus is tying on some boxing gloves. Snoopy already has a boxing glove on, right on top of his snout. We then have one, two, three, four, five, six panels of basically Linus uh, getting the snot beat out of him by Snoopy, who is just basically headbutting him with the boxing glove attached to his snout. Linus walks in to talk to Lucy, looking disheveled. Lucy says, Well, how did the boxing go? Linus says, not so good. I got beaten. He puts the boxing gloves away in his toy box. Lucy says, really? What was it that beat you? Was it a left or a right? Linus thinks, I don't know. Then in classic thumb and blanket pose, he says to Lucy, when you stop to think about it, it's kind of hard to say. I love this. I love it because for the visuals. It's great. This is a great strip. But that, that visual of, of Snoopy with the glove is classic. And the way he hits. Great it's drawing. Classic. Yeah. I know I don't have to answer this, but I assume neither of you had boxing gloves growing up. Uh, I've never hit anyone in my life. My friend oh. Frankie had uh, boxing gloves. And I remember he's like, hey, come on down. I got boxing gloves. So I walked down to his house and he has two sets of boxing gloves. And him and this kid, Max, his next door neighbor, are just beating the hell out of each other <laughs> for like <laughs> 10 minutes straight. And then uh, Max was done. And he goes, OK, your turn. It's like, yeah, yeah pass. It's a hard pass. You can't risk the money maker. Are you kidding? <laughs> All right. August 3rd. Lucy, Charlie Brown, and Linus are all outside. Lucy is talking. I think it is possible to be too nice. She continues. By golly, nobody's going to walk all over me. No, sir. If anybody's going to do any walking, it's going to be me. Lucy walks away, pounding on her fist as she continues. There's only one way to survive these days. You have to walk over them before they walk over you. Now alone, Charlie Brown and Linus are standing there. And Linus says to Charlie Brown, It must be nice to have a philosophy that will sustain you in times of need. Yeah, Schultz had been reading uh, Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> <laughs> that really... <laughs> Yeah. I can see Atlas Shrugged done as the Peanuts cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> that would be great. John Galt would be Schroeder. Yeah. Instead of the fountain head, it's the fountain pen. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough free publicity for Ayn Rand. <laughs> August 14th. Charlie Brown, Linus, and Lucy are standing on a hill looking at the clouds. Aren't the clouds beautiful? They look like big balls of cotton, says Lucy. In the next panel, our heroes are all lying on their backs, looking at the sky. 
Lucy says, I could just lie here all day and watch them drift by. She points to the sky as she continues. If you use your imagination, you can see lots of things in the cloud formations. What do you think you see, Linus? Linus says, well, those clouds up there look to me like the map of the British Honduras on the Caribbean. That cloud up there looks a little like the profile of Thomas Aikens, the famous painter and sculptor. Linus continues, and that group of clouds over there gives me the impression of the stoning of Stephen. I can see the Apostle Paul standing there to one side. At this point, Charlie Brown lifts his head from the ground, stupefied by what he is hearing. Lucy says, "Uh uh-huh, that's very good. What do you see in the clouds, Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown says, well, I was going to say I saw a ducky and a horsey, but I changed my mind. (laughs) We've seen this one already. This was a William Pepper pick. It's a great pick. When you talk with people about peanuts uh, that just, you know, are not huge fans of peanuts, I'm surprised, you know, this one comes up uh, quite a bit. I, I don't, it just, this is like so classic peanuts. It's so well done. Yeah, I I absolutely love this strip. And again, remember it from, it from childhood, just kind of being in awe of Linus, just like just like Charlie Brown is. And then, you know, and feeling like Charlie Brown, like, wow, you know, I can't I can't live up to that. But uh, at the same time, to be in, to be in the presence of someone who sees those things is pretty cool. A hundred percent. Although Lucy and Linus are definitely from a home, they're, they're ending up in therapy. I, I've ever the more, <laughs> I don't know why I see that they're just they're both. Well, I, I love I love this little moment here where you know we've seen Lucy as the big sister to Linus, and she's at first teaching him things that he's he's swallowing whole cloth no matter what it is she says, and then he starts to question whether she knows what she's talking about. But here they're kind of in this stasis where. Lucy's leading this and Lucy's having, you know, them say what they see. And then I love that Linus goes through all this stuff that I'm sure Lucy knows nothing about. And then she's going, uh-huh, that's very good. <laughs> you know, like, oh yeah. She's totally just playing along. But of course, no one questions whether Linus is just making it, just saying a bunch of stuff he heard somebody else. Say. Yeah. But it, it, well, it, I'm impressed with Charlie Brown being honest. Yeah. And right. Trying to fake it. Yeah. 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 And and I kind of like this little moment where the older sister, younger brother thing is is kind of working out here. You know, despite yeah. their differences, they each have a role to play in this little this little scene. And yeah. And Charlie Brown is 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 just so honest. You have to love him. Uh, one of the best punchlines in the history of the strip and not a punchline really like it, i mean it is a punchline of course but but it just gains the depth because you know who charlie brown is and you know that charlie brown was legitimately going to say hey i saw a ducky and a horsey you know and i was darn proud that i looked just like a ducky uh but he's just not he's not at linus's level of of imagination for sure mm-hmm. sure jimmy you said they're going to need a psychologist. Yeah. Well, there is one there. And I think it's very strange this year that he, he introduced the psychiatric booth last year and he hasn't gone back yet. It's wild. I mean, it's probably one of the top two or three things you think about when you think about peanuts is Lucy's psychiatry booth. Uh And um, yeah, it, it, it wasn't instantly a part of the strip like so many other things that he tried out and just worked. Yeah. Took him a while to realize what he had. All right. Well, I'm excited about the next strip we're going to cover because this proves my theory from last episode. So here we go. August 21st, Charlie Brown and Linus are standing out in the ball field, but it's starting to rain. Charlie Brown says, Oh no, but it's only rains harder. Charlie Brown actually walks away, giving up on the ball game. He says, rats, every time you want to do something, it rains. We then see two panels of Linus standing in the pouring rain. He looks up at the sky and says, rain, rain, go away. Come again some other day. Instantly, it clears up. Shocking Linus beyond belief. He looks up at the sky. He looks back out at us, but just sort of off in the general distance, shocked by what has happened. Then he runs home, terrified, slamming the door behind him, and then runs up to Lucy, an expression of absolute panic on his face. And he says, hide me. 
So here you go. Charles Schultz is a character in Peanuts. That's the way well, I look at that. Well, no, I think the deity that blew up the kite is... Which is Charles Schultz. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, you can look at it that way. But it's definitely a trickster god. Yeah, it's Charles Schultz. Because he's told us it's a comic strip. Uh -huh. Twice. Three times. So we either take him at his word or we don't. But here, you know, this would not happen in our world, right? Right. I, and it doesn't make it, I don't mean it's only a comic strip that doesn't, this doesn't diminish it to me at all that suddenly uh, all kinds of, of different rules apply to it. Uh, in, if anything, it makes it, it richer to me. And, you know, I was thinking about it. You see this in instances with like Charlie Brown, there's a pop fly, which Charlie Brown is about to catch. And it stays up in the air for six days while people have complete conversations underneath it it explains yes. even how that that potato chip thing works right it's that schultz actively is part of this strip and messes with the characters so he's performing miracles yeah. within the strip. but i don't i don't believe in charles schultz actually <laughs> <laughs> there's the title <laughs> So this is a three Sunday strip in a row sequence, which this is pretty new for him to, he did it with the golfing out uh, episode. I'm sure he's done it a few couple times. But what's interesting, you know, you're, so Jimmy, you're essentially saying that Schultz is entering into the world of, as the creator and he is performing these miracles within the strip that become a part of the strip. And that makes him a mm -hmm. character in the strip, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And what's interesting to me is over the three strips, they try to kind of prove it by having Linus replicate it. And mm -hmm. he, he replicates it once in front of Lucy. And then it's Lucy, Charlie Brown and Linus in the final strip to, and there, this is like, this is going to prove it once and for all. If Linus is capable of doing this himself and uh, it's not resolved, Linus chokes and he can't even say rain, rain, go away. And so the rain just was pouring and pouring and pouring. And so it, it's just, yeah, given what you're saying, Jimmy, it's really interesting to think of the idea of some outside force entering a world that has the rules of that world, which are not our rules, but we've learned the rules of peanuts more or less. And then the rules are bent or broken in a way that is not character based directly, you know? Unless Linus does have the power to stop rain, <laughs> which right, makes sure we don't he, we don't find out one way or the other if he if he did, right. that, you know. But that makes Schultz a character, like you're saying, in the strip, and that maybe adds something to the strip that very few artists dare to go. They, they don't. There's something about this strip that makes it kind of transcendent for some people in terms of how they've experienced it and what it means to them because of this. And I think when you're thinking about the strip, you know, and you think about it as this 50 year long work, when you're constantly foregrounding Schultz as the central element of the strip, the whole strip becomes more interesting and richer. And you also are able to appreciate and even like the down moments. Because it's not just, oh, these characters aren't the way I remember them or this or it's it's sillier now or whatever. It's like, oh, this is where Schultz was at this point in time, you know, and Absolutely, how, yeah. how am I feel? How am I jiving with him? I used to I, when I was on I was a guest on a radio show in KCRW years ago and I was talking about Liz Fair. And I said, the only thing about Liz Fair is it's not really even about whether or not you like individual songs. It's just that. She's somehow the way she writes makes her feel like a friend to you. And you just want to check in with your friend, even if you're not on the same page anymore or you're you, or you haven't been recently or whatever. And that's how I always felt about Schultz. It was I always felt his presence in the strip. And that made me connect with it. Yeah. More because I felt like it was a direct letter I, from him to me every day. Yeah, I, I, I kind of feel the same way I uh, when I'm looking back on on you know, as a little kid, as you tried to learn more about Schultz and then they occasionally would put out uh, a book or there was something where you could see a little article in interviewing Schultz. Um, it, it, it meant so much to me to know who this person was behind the strip. Now, maybe I, it's because I wanted to be a cartoonist as a little kid. 
I don't know how universal that is for other people who read and really enjoyed Peanuts, whether it was important to know who it was behind the strip, but maybe that's because Schultz really was in the strip, like you're saying. And he kept exuding this kind of integrity uh, toward the strip. And he was saying, this, this is extremely important to me. And I have my own set of rules that I live by when I make the strip, no one else will touch it. Only I will do it. He sets up this, this, this myth about himself. Not, and I don't say myth in the sense of myth being false, but a, a story, this, this overarching right. story that's, that's, that's huge <laughs> about this world. And so whenever he would say something like, well, I consider a good strip to be, you have each character as a, p- a key on the piano and you're playing the, you have to have all the notes to play the perfect strip. I mean, I was just like, he's spoon feeding this stuff and I'm like totally taking it in because I know what his strip has meant to me. And I know, and I can't put in words what it's meant to me, but he's somehow, he's somehow entered into my life in a way that no other artist has. And so just going back to what you're saying, when you, when you said in the previous episode, you introduced or kind of expanded on the idea that he is a character. It really got me thinking uh, a lot because I'm, I'm, I've noticed in my own work that I do constantly do that where I'm having a story is being dealt with, with from a plane that's outside the story. Uh, And you do it. Mm -hmm. I know in, in, in your books as well, Jimmy. And I think that's part of why I fell in love with love with the work that you've done is that element is there. And it, it make, it takes you to a place, takes me to a place in my mind that is a place I, I love to be. I love to, I love to live in a world of an artist who I like, I, I respect, I trust. And, uh, and I do, like you're saying with Liz Fair, I feel invited into that world. Right. I'm, I'm being told, you know, c- come in and, and live inside my, my yeah. world, inside my mind. And that's a, that's a huge gift to be able to, to do that in a way that is so uniquely artistic. Again, you could do that as a stand up comedian, right? But here it's got so many layers to it because he spent hours of his life creating this world that is from a blank piece of paper. It's it. I don't know. It's, it's magical. Yeah, it, it is. And it's a hard thing to do because you have to be really brave to do that because you're, you're including yourself in your work in a way that removes a lot of the shield a work of art can give you, you know, the, the, yeah. that's the work is the work and I'm me. But if you, if, but when you remove that barrier, that's, t- I mean, Liz Fair has gotten reviews for her music that are not about her music. <laughs> They're about her person. Oh yeah. You know, and, and, and then there's elements of that with the way people react to Schultz too, because they feel an ownership of this person. Yes. But it's weird to be, I, I think because Schultz, like you said, had that integrity of the strip. That's why the licensing and stuff and the animation and everything else, Knott's Berry Farm, whatever, never bothered me one way or the other. Right. Because the art is the strip and the strip is a hundred percent. It's just as pure as any yeah. Robert Crumb. And everything else was, in, it was inspired and involves others. It's not Schultz. It's not pure Schultz. Right. And so now you're just seeing how others are playing with Schultz and it's, it's not going to be the genius of Schultz, you know, pure distilled Schultz is, is the strip and there's no other place where it exists. And, uh, you know, I can think of du- like duck amok and you guys have seen the Warner brothers oh, cartoon. Yeah, uh, where where Daffy Duck is is being constantly <laughs> mistreated by the artists of the cartoon that he's in, and that's done for a laugh, and it's it's done it's it's kind of whimsical, it's kind of capricious, and Bugs Bunny turns out to be the artist, and he's ain't I a stinker, and it's like that's cute, and it, and people really like that strip because it does deal with those different planes, but all you get out of that strip is ain't I a stinker, with, with, right, out of, right, out of that, right, that cartoon, right, right. but in this thing you're getting a whole person and, and, and his, and his attempts at, at integrity and at warmth and at meaning and at, at a doing something that was worthwhile and positive. And that, that makes it really a rich experience to, to read peanuts. For sure. Hey, just uh, talking about duck and muck. Duck and muck is prevented from being the all time greatest Warner brothers cartoon by one thing. Oh, Bugs Bunny doesn't cause problems. 
Bugs Bunny reacts to problems. That's the whole every that's like Chuck Jones number one rule. And that this is not my rule. This is him. He has stated this is that Bugs Bunny is just living his life. And then suddenly Elmer Fudd or whoever comes along and causes problems in that Daffy Duck's just living his life. And Bugs Bunny causes problems. Yeah. 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 There's, that makes it the number two after Duck Dodgers. Okay. <laughs> August 22nd. Linus meets Sally on the sidewalk. He says to her, look, it's Charlie Brown's little sister. And she's walking. And we see Sally do a little two-step there on the sidewalk. Linus runs away announcing, she's walking, she's walking, she's walking. Sally blissfully thinks to herself, isn't he the cutest thing? This is really odd that... The <laughs> two, the, well, there's two things I want to say. One is what we I would consider the two most important things he did in 1959. One was to introduce Sally, and the other was the psychiatrist booth. And here we are in August, and this is the first time she showed up this year. I thought she it was a brilliant character the way he introduced her in the last year but he had to find a a, a hook to bring her back into the strip and this is the first of a series which is really heartbreaking i mean more so i think than the the charlie brown his his little sister falls in love with linus and uh, we haven't selected any of the others in this sequence but she's like madly in love with linus and then she overhears him saying, you know, to defend himself, saying, you know, ah, she's just a she's just a little kid. And she's like totally destroyed by this. And what's really, yeah, that's also really heartbreaking about it is, you know, it opens with Linus showing an interest in her. You know, he's the one that's noticing that that she's she's walking and and he's he's got this sincerity toward her that's really kind of kind from a little boy to a much younger little girl he is showing her kindness and he is putting up with her to a point and then he he hits a wall and then her hopes about him given that he is kind of this sincere little character that he ultimately hits you know hits his limit and her hopes are dashed it's it's a pretty complex relationship that you know it's not like things i've seen in other other literature where you know there there is there is an affinity between them there is this connection. It's just, well, I guess, I guess it's the classic, it's the classic, you know, I just want to be friends kind of story. Right. Um, right. When one character wants more of the other character and the other character likes them, wants to, wants to hang out with them, likes to have interact, uh, appreciates things about them, but it's not on the level that, 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 that they want. And because of the nature of these two characters, it comes across as very real. They're, they're two unique characters that are not just stereotypes. I mean, as we said, Linus is the most complex uh, character in Western literature. So, <laughs> so uh, Sally's chosen, chosen well, <laughs> but uh, he's not available. I love the last panel drawing. I just think that's, and I love this. I love all the drawing actually. And you know, we don't talk about the Nard as much. I don't think because now it's like settled into this classic peanuts thing. Yeah. But boy, it, he's still a really great cartoonist and just draws really, really fun drawings. I thought what well, Michael you're going to say is, how did she get outside if she's just learning to walk? And how did they let her out <laughs> to the point that this random kid from God knows where in the neighborhood witnesses her first step? Oh, in those days, parents did not care about the children. <laughs> this this was standard commonplace, 1960 things. So, yeah, yeah. And the, and the other thing is, you like both of these characters. You know, uh, often, yeah. often when they set up the love triangle or whatever, you know, you're supposed to, they have the character who's lesser so that you know who you're going to root for, you know, mm-hmm. when in a, in a classic movie or whatever. But here, mm-hmm. these are just two likable characters where they're, they're just not jibing. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it is sweet and it's heartbreaking, but you, you, you really feel for both of them, the predicament they're in. September 8th, Charlie Brown, Snoopy. Violet and Linus are all hanging out by Snoopy's doghouse. Snoopy and Charlie Brown in particular look worried. Violet says, 
We can't let them build the freeway here and destroy Snoopy's house. Linus says, maybe we should write a letter of protest. Violet looks at Linus and says, to whom? Linus says, I don't know. How about Sam Sneed? I've always kind of admired him. Sam Sneed makes a comeback. Yes. Do we have to do a new uh, explainer? <laughs> we'll refer them back to the transcript. Sam Sneed, big, uh, big golfer, and clearly one of Schultz's idols because he's mentioned him a number of times. Yeah. This might be the longest sequence of the year. And it's, this is almost like a self contained little drama here. Yeah. Uh, we're coming in in the middle, but the whole thing with the, the freeway and Snoopy's house being going to be knocked down is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, adventure, you know, continuity comics would have, I imagine where, you know, there's a problem right. and it looks bad and then it resolves right. itself and everyone's happy. So he runs this a couple of weeks. So are you okay with the premise here, Michael? Cause I know you didn't particularly, maybe you, you Jimmy also didn't like the idea that we had this icicle strip where, Snoopy's doghouse has been moved to be underneath the the eaves of a house just yeah. for the setup of this gag. Well, now, well, if there's a highway going to be run through Snoopy's doghouse, <laughs> it's running through their neighbor is going to destroy the yeah, whole. There's bigger problems than just Snoopy's <laughs> doghouse. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, no, well, this didn't bother me. Um, yeah, because he's not violating his own rules anywhere. Yeah, he's not moving the doghouse, which is like kind of cheating to manufacture the drama. That's how I felt anyway. So it, can you accept that the kids are not really thinking about themselves at all because they just, that's just them. They are, they're only worried about Snoopy and unless Charlie Brown's been walking like, like three quarters of a mile to deliver the dog food. I, I mean, it's not my favorite sequence to be honest, but you know, yeah, it's fine. It, it feels like it's a, it's a retread of the icicle thing, I guess, in some ways. And I love, I love the Schultz long stories. Not always though, does he stick the landing? And and I think this is one where it just kind of gets kicked down the road. And, and it's tough because, because he's doing these short stories that also kind of have to be self-contained jokes. So the conclusion also has to be a joke. And that's, and because of that, it almost has to be a punchline that sums up everything. And a lot of times that doesn't, play off on that very last one do you think schultz is sometimes not sticking the landing on purpose like he has some philosophy about yeah. these things that, that that they go on for a long time and you, you just keep mulling over them looking at them from different angles and then is it on purpose that he's like okay now we've we've examined this let's move on but we're not going to try to settle anything i think it's on purpose in the sense that he thinks it's successful to do some sort of last punchline that sort of minimizes the drama of the rest of the thing, but I don't know that it necessarily works as a story. Like I think yeah, he couldn't do this because he's doing these one a day plus a Sunday strip that's unrelated, you know, but like if you could somehow work the beginning and the end together, he tries to do this on the Mr. Sack thing, which is the fame, his favorite short story from peanuts from the early seventies, which is when uh, Charlie Brown goes to summer camp with a rash on his head, so he puts a paper bag over his head and instantly everybody loves him and becomes like camp president and stuff like that. But there also he tries to tie it into the beginning, but it doesn't quite work. And it's because I think because the last reveal has to be a punchline to the whole story. It often for me falls flat. Right. And for the record, for those of you who are following along at home, um, the way Schultz wraps this one up is that Charlie Brown announces to Snoopy, who is determinedly standing on top of his doghouse to, to fend off anybody who's going to come and, and tear down his place. Uh, Charlie Brown says, you can, you can cut the pose. They're not starting work until 1967, you know? And, and then <laughs> Snoopy says, well, that's kind of disappointing. I thought I looked pretty good up there. <laughs> September 28th, Schroeder is reading to Lucy. Sometimes he would startle people in public places. Schroeder continues, he flew out in anger against all that was petty, dull, or greedy in men. Often, however, his scorn would turn to high hilarity and humorous jests. Lucy, now leaning on Schroeder's toy piano, asks him, are you reading about Beethoven or Mort Saul? All right, Mort Saul making another uh, appearance. <laughs> I think we mentioned him earlier. Harold, do you want to explain him at all? Is that an obscurity? Uh, Michael, do you got you have any uh, any insights on on Mort? Yeah, I'm a big fan. 
He just died last oh, nice. year too. Um, he did. It was 94, 96, yeah, yeah. 94 years old. Um, yeah. yeah. Mort was a stand up comic and he didn't do jokes. He'd get up on stage with the, with the newspaper and just start talking about whatever's happening politically. You know, it was, it was a funny bit, but he ne- there were never gags, like pre-written gags. He was just improvising. Yeah, right. It was all improvised. Yeah. yeah. So all this, this description here would sound like Mort Saul. So would you say in some ways Saul and Schultz have some things in common? And, you know, they, uh, they not, say, politi- not politically, I don't think. I mean, some people say he's the first, I think Wikipedia says he's the first uh, modern comedian. Uh, I'm just thinking of like, you know, Schultz kind of blazed his own trail uh, in roughly the same time. Do you yeah. think there's any, any similarities in terms of how they're stripping things down or? I think Schultz is, would be closer to like a Bob Newhart. Mm. Okay. As far yeah, as I can see that. Psychological. Uh, Saul was purely political, which would be more like what Walt, Walt Kelly was doing in those, those yeah. years. Yes. Yeah, Saul and Kelly, I can, I can see together. It's always a shame about those guys. Cause I mean, so many really, really bright, I mean, that's not a shame. They have wonderful careers and they contribute to the culture and everything. But, you know, 50, 60 years later, their work becomes, you know, kind of unintelligible if you're not completely versed in the culture in which it came out of. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's true. And and often it doesn't doesn't uh, age well, too. Right. I well, mean, Saul, that, Saul that be became an early conspiracy theorist. Well, right. He was big on the Warren Commission, right? That was he like got his- obsessed with it to the point that he wasn't even making jokes anymore. He would just get up oh. and read from the Warren report. <laughs> he had a TV show, like a daily TV show in L.A. And yeah, people at that, at that point were like, not that there was any conspiracy around Kennedy. I mean, that's absurd, <laughs> but no, he was no, it was more like Lenny Bruce who was at that point was just talking about injustice in the police and racism. And, you know, it was barely a comic. Mm-hmm. All right. So that's Mort Saul. That's Mort. September 30th, Lucy is holding a book and talking to Linus. She says, Did you ever stop to think that when I was one year old, you weren't even born? Linus stands up and says, I've not only thought about it, I remember it. I was up in heaven waiting to be born. Linus stands up in classic thumb and blanket pose and says, I didn't mind waiting though. Then with a smile, he says, We used to have some pretty good times up there. Now this raises some questions. <laughs> I'm glad you're here to answer them. <laughs> now, this is why I'm th- Linus. You also have to understand Linus is insane. <laughs> I mean, he's a or wonderful is- thought. Yeah. <laughs> Linus does not remember living up in heaven before. He's either messing with Lucy, which is possible, or he believes it. And that's well, the, the, <laughs> based on the final panel. Those of you on September 30th want to go look it up. Uh, however, you can look it up. The look on his face, if I were to put a a, uh, a term to it, I would say is sincerity. Oh, I don't I think, think he's pulling it. anybody's leg now. But is there is another strip? I can't because re- I, 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 you know all we do is read peanuts and talk about it, so I can't remember if this was something we covered on the show or if it's something coming up. But someone else makes a reference very similar to this, and then another character says, "Your um, understanding of medicine and theology is appalling." Or something like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's like the same joke looked at as from a different way. But no, I believe loose. I believe this is the side of Linus that also believes the Great Pumpkin is coming. I I mean, the the way he leaves it here, it's like he doesn't resolve it. Mm -mm. You just have Lucy looking at him with what looks like a little bit of uh, concern (laughs) and disbelief, but mainly just kind of what the... (laughs) I mean, it's it's a really interesting strip that he just lets hang there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like what? What? Well, you know, the <laughs> other thing is that kids do just have flights of fantasy that they incorporate into their own life. I mean, I could see a kid being, oh, yeah, I totally remember being in heaven before I was born. Like, I mean, you know, just on a stupid level, you know, my kids had Tony and Dutch, and they lived at Target, <laughs> and they were just, you know, their imaginary friends. So it could be something yeah. like that too. And in strips before this, when it involves the kids, there's usually somebody to go, well, I can't stand it. I just can't stand it. Or, right. uh, you know, 
where they they get their comeuppance one way or through you even like the, the great pumpkin sequences they somebody has to respond to the the fact that this is a, an amazing like mind-blowing statement mm-hmm. and this one just just stands there and i i don't think to me it's like the first time he goes there there's something he's doing that he has not done before in this little strip that it again takes peanuts just to a level it's not been at before and then it 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 adds mystery it adds concern for linus however you want to look at it it just it, it, it it's left up to you to respond to it however you're going to respond to it. In, in panel three we see the look on lucy's face which is her calculating how much money he's going to have to spend on therapy in later years <laughs> Nicola, <laughs> love that's a great story. october 5th linus and lucy outside again lucy says to linus who is standing under a tree Charlie Brown tells me you've been talking to leaves. Linus says, talking to what? Lucy says, to leaves. He says, you talk to leaves. Linus is indignant. He says, he's crazy. You go tell Charlie Brown that I said. Suddenly, a leaf flutters from the tree. Linus whips his head around and says, oh, hi there. And then continues to Lucy. But I said he's out of his mind. I talk to leaves. I don't know. I don't understand why he's making fun of that. Did you guys? <laughs> I remember a leaf flows in front of you. Don't you say hello? I thought everyone did. And there is in panel four, that is Lucy contemplating how much money Michael is going to have to spend <laughs> on therapy. <laughs> but my problem is I, I all I give them all the same name, Leafy. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next week when I have two new friends discussing. <laughs> Broomhilda, (laughs) where we don't get into these weird discussions (laughs) about leaves and existential philosophy. October 9th, Lucy and Linus are out playing in a sandbox. Lucy hears something. What's that, she says? Linus says, what's what? Lucy says, I thought I heard a car door slam. Linus is up, pointing. He says, it's dad. He's backing the car out of the garage. Linus yells in the direction of his father. Hey, Dad, are you going to the store? Will you bring me something? Lucy says, tell him I want a comic book. Linus continues to yell. Lucy wants a comic book, and I want a candy bar. Now Lucy is yelling. I want a candy bar, too. Linus says, Lucy wants a candy bar, too, and I want a comic book, too. And can I have a boat? Linus is now running in the direction of his father. Will you bring me a boat or a football? He's picking up speed. Will you bring me a candy bar and a comic book and a boat and... Oh, he walks back to Lucy. He was just backing the car into the driveway to wash it. (laughs) This is why Linus is the most complex character in Western literature. (laughs) Because you would think of him as not a materialist. Right. And the joke here is all kids are total materialists. Right. Yeah. Why is this Linus and not Lucy? Why do you think he chose Linus? I don't know. I remember, you know, talking about strips I remember from childhood. This is one of the strongest ones from this year. I remember specifically as a kid being fascinated that this is what the kids do. The kids, if they see dad heading out, they're going to ask for a thing. I was like, a candy bar, a comic book. Wow. You know, I never asked my dad for a comic book or a candy <laughs> bar, you know, like that. And I, and I, I mean, I remember just mulling this over in my mind as you know a seven-year-old kid or whatever just fascinated with the concept that that dynamic could exist with a, a parent <laughs> really so it, you it, would never go hey get me a comic book from the jiffy no Mart? really no not at this age no oh, it was wow. it was a revelation to me that such a thing could exist and yeah it, it's one of those weird little things that it's so ingrained in me i was so fascinated with the, with the materialist in me as a little kid it's like you can do that you know, and I, I didn't own a comic book back then. I didn't, I'm sure I'd gotten a candy bar or two, but, uh, you didn't, when did, wait, so, whoa, 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 whoa. so when was, did you get your first comic book? 42. You know, (laughs) I, I wasn't, man, I don't even know. I I think, um, for a while I wasn't, I, I wasn't allowed to have them. I think it was around 19. So let's see, I would have been maybe 11 or 12 when i could buy comic books 
Really? Um, now we went to the library. So, you know, we, so Linus's library card thing meant a lot to me <laughs> that, you know, we'd go to the library and, and we would go to used bookstores um, that did not have comic books, or if they did have comic books, they weren't on the table for me to walk away with. I was always getting the collections of comic strips, you know, the types of things that were in book form. And I don't know what it was, you know, my mom would have been around 14 or 15 when the whole comics code thing came about with all of the Senate hearings about juvenile delinquency. You know, I don't, I don't know in the back of her mind if, if her experience with comics or they were, they were lesser, but yeah, it was not a part of my life. And, and just this, this world where it's tantalizingly close to have these things, this strip embodied that for me. And, and boy, that's a, that's a strong, strong memory from childhood. And then, you know, just the, and then the fact that they don't get anything at the end, um, you know, <laughs> sets it back to zero. But still, I, I went on this tantalizing journey with Linus and Lucy. Uh, I could always hit my dad. My dad was a soft touch, as they would say. I could always hit him up for a candy bar or a comic book. I would uh, actually not even ask when he would just say, I'm going down to Jiffy Mart ever. I just kind of sidle up to him and grin. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what i was collecting around the time i read this um because they were a nickel and i was allowed for whatever reason little wacky packages which were those parody brand things so like it was like something in a supermarket that you would have they were, they were parodies of the packaging for toothpaste and cereal and you name it um those things i did collect and that was allowed in my world but i was using my own i did have an allowance mm -hmm. i was using my own nickel it was a nickel to, to buy a pack of those wow. see we learn things about each other on unpacking peanuts <laughs> november 1st linus looks distraught charlie brown and snoopy look on as he says i believed in the great pumpkin i really did Linus continues, I believed in the great pumpkin with every fiber of my being. Then he walks away, completely destroyed, saying, rats. Charlie Brown is sitting on the curb with Snoopy, and he says, In all this world, there is nothing more upsetting than the clobbering of a cherished belief. And Snoopy thinks to himself, true. Why, why does he have Snoopy underscore Charlie Brown statement? <laughs> it's very weird. That is wild. That to me sounds like Schultz wanted that someone get across. Right. He wanted people to seriously consider that. It wasn't just a, a joke. It wasn't just a, you know, a, th a throwaway gag or Charlie Brown's unique, odd perspective. It's like having Snoopy just sitting next to Charlie Brown in agreement. I don't remember seeing that before in the strip either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't seem like a Schultzian thing to do. No, it doesn't. You know, uh, one thing I wanted to say about the Great Pumpkin, and I was always kind of looking for a great place to put it, but I, this is as good as any other. One of the best pieces of writing advice I ever read was from the comic book author Alan Moore. And he was talking specifically about when he had to like take over a, a character that had already been created, like Swamp Thing or, you know, uh, whatever, Miracle Man, the things he, he was working on at the time. But it also just works if you're, just writing anything it, it, it doesn't work in every situation but what it is is that let's say you're writing a superhero story and there's five or six things that make that superhero story a superhero story and you want to make an impact you don't go in and you don't change four of the five you don't change you change one thing and you let everything else be the same and i started to think wow that's just a brilliant thing because once that you make that one change it spider webs out and and it um you know has domino effects and suddenly everything is starting to change and all this all the great pumpkin is is moving it from christmas to halloween and just that one change unlocks this whole world of absurdity in this thing that we all do every single year or not all of us but millions and millions of us do all over the world every year christmas time for kids right and I just thought that is such a neat way to, and I, I, I just because I thought the more thing was interesting to contemplate, I kind of look for that in, in pop culture to see if, oh, there's kind of an example of it. And I think this is a great one. All he did was move the holiday up one. You, you told me about that years ago, Jimmy. And I think that that is a profound piece of advice for, for a writer who's trying to figure out how to add their touch to something. Uh, and, and mix it up. I, th I think that is a brilliant piece of advice from Alan Moore. Hey, we're talking about peanuts. We're talking about Liz Fair. We're talking about Alan Moore. We get into all of it here. Or it's all. 
<laughs> Mars, <laughs> those are the big don't three. forget more so <laughs> in the and pantheon we didn't, men- we didn't mention the other guy who i'm not going to mention dr seuss <laughs> oh, okay then <laughs> <laughs> albert Mason Turner. Yeah. oh <laughs> al. yeah um oh and we got one more coming up uh not too distant uh future here for this year november 3rd linus walks up looking disillusioned to charlie brown who's holding a little bag of something and he says to charlie brown what's the cure for disillusionment charlie brown charlie brown says to linus a chocolate cream and a friendly pat on the back and he offers the bag to linus who selects a candy and charlie brown walks away smiling as linus helps himself to the treat then linus looking much better with a smile on his face says good old charlie brown there we see him in that older brother patriarch kind of role that we were, were talking about seeing him in earlier yeah it seems like schultz is getting more and more comfortable with showing different sides of a character without it negating what we knew and thought about the character before and and you know given the tension that he creates where charlie brown keeps failing over and over again and just can't seem to find a way to get to where he wants to get in life and then you have this little moment very little moment where he's he's just it has has the right answer for for mm-hmm. uh, for Linus, and and then the last line is "Good old Charlie Brown." And the, now at this point, and in, in, when it when in Peanuts do we get the Sunday strip saying Peanuts featuring "Good old Charlie Brown"? Well, not like, yet. So the, is this the first time we hear this? I mean, not, not the first time we've heard it. We've heard it at the very first, very first strip, right? <laughs> Wait, is this the first? Is this <laughs> my favorite so, portion of our podcast? Is this the first? <laughs> Who knows? So, so in the very first strip, here comes good old Charlie Brown. It's like good old Charlie Brown has been with us since the very first strip. But this is the first time I, I we're talking about it first. I think the first time that maybe somebody really sincerely says it about mm-hmm. him, Nine which i think is pretty cool and it is an insult saying you're ordinary charlie brown and this is i don't know if it's the first time but it's definitely one of the rare times where someone means it in the way it's intended and i think this does tie back to michael's theory that uh schultz is now working with hallmark cards <laughs> and uh he's he's putting his mind in a certain place he hasn't before yeah right well yeah, this certainly go... contradicts charlie brown's you know main complaint which is he has no friends yeah linus has always been his friend yeah yeah and you know yeah and plus the fact that in you know almost every strip he's hanging out with somebody right i mean i'd call that a friend somebody you hang out with every day yeah i mean charlie brown does not see the forest for the trees when it comes to his life a lot of time, which you know it's true for all of us i'm sure yeah yeah and he has great friends. Look at, read the next one. November 17th. Schroeder is talking to Lucy. He says, why should I give you something for Beethoven's birthday? I don't even like you. In panel two, Schroeder walks away and Charlie Brown enters the panel. In panel three, Lucy turns, sees Charlie Brown and says, well, I don't like you either. And she leaves and Charlie Brown is left alone. And he says, I don't even know what's going on. That's a punchline he's used a lot. <laughs> it's a great one. It is a great one. You know, going back to the the thing that you were saying about um, the Hallmark thing, too. Yeah, that is interesting That in that you could take those first two panels of the strip before and turn that into a a Hallmark card, right? You wouldn't say disillusionment because that would be a weird thing to give someone a Hallmark card for. <laughs> I have a friend who's disillusioned, you know? <laughs> But what's a cure for being down in the dumps? Chocolate cream. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Really interesting. And then uh, this one. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just that it's another one of these instances. It really only works if you know these characters. So it's the opposite of a greeting card, really. Yep. December 5th. Snoopy's asleep on the ground with a big Z over his head. Charlie Brown walks up and says, Beagles on the grass, alas. Then he walks away and Snoopy says, I ain't no stupid beagle. Now, I don't know who picks the strips that we, but I knew instantly that this had to be Harold pick. Oh, yeah. And why is that? Beagles on the grass, alas. That's got to be a poem. That's a poem, (laughs) isn't it? 
No, I don't think is it is it a reference to anything? I just it assume that it, it it is my last peanuts obscurity explained for the year. Yes. Peanuts obscurity explained. So this is from a poem by Gertrude Stein. It's very short. It's Pigeons on the Grass, Alas. Pigeons on the Grass, Alas. Short, longer grass, short, longer. Longer, shorter, yellow grass. Pigeons, large pigeons on the shorter, longer, yellow grass, alas. Pigeons on the grass. Shout out to Gertie Stein. Gertie Stein, Liz Fair, Mort Stahl. We got them all. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I think Virgil Thompson wrote music for this. It somehow became some part of some other. It was it was performed musically as part of a. a I think it was a Broadway show that was directed by John Houseman. There all, you go. Of all people, so there's Mr. John uh, there's a Paper mu- Chase. There's a musical connection. Uh, yeah, and uh, the fact that I'm assuming Schultz is is somehow reading Gertrude Stein. I mean, we we've heard that he has quite a library and he's very well read. He's apparently watching Mort Saul. <laughs> on late, late night shows or whatever and you know gertrude stein is yet another uh person that he's obviously thinking about and whether or not he thinks someone's going to understand he's referring to something he's he's quite happy to include it in, in a an unusual little strip where it's it, you know when it, whenever he does strips like this i feel like he's honoring somebody mm-hmm. because the joke doesn't pay off in its own terms you know, the Snoopy saying, I ain't no stupid beagle. But he is a beagle, isn't he? <laughs> well, that, but that goes Here back go. to this. This is, the <laughs> this is the crux of the Snoopy character arc, right? Snoopy might be a beagle, but he's choos- he is not going to end up a beagle, right? He, he, and you're the one that pointed that out, right? He is angry about being thought of as a dog when he's younger in the, in the strip. And uh, it's just going to keep going that way. Yeah, is he is he uh, offended by the alas? Is he interpreting the? Alas I don't think it's that a... because he said because he then makes you know he says stupid beagle. Well, is he saying I ain't no stupid beagle, or is he saying I ain't no stupid beagle? Right, because if if alas means that there's something negative about being a beagle, then he's saying, well, I'm not stupid, but I am a beagle, or I'm should not. Have said a I should have said I ain't no stinking beagle. That would have been <laughs> I ain't no stinking beagle. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know what? I give up. I don't understand peanuts. <laughs> Me neither. Let's stop right here. December 13th. Charlie Brown is out in his front yard contemplating a football that lies in the grass. He says, that's odd. In the second panel, he says, last night I left my football in the backyard and this morning it's in the front yard. Very peculiar, he says as he walks away. In the distance, we see Snoopy peeking out from behind a tree. In the last panel, Snoopy runs up to the ball and kicks it into the air, thinking to himself, the mad punter strikes again. This this is a quite a long sequence. Does he does he come back to this? I, I remember this so again so vividly from my childhood. I don't know if it was just like five or six, eight strips in a series and he was done, he never revisited it. But I remember this one very vividly as mm-hmm. just being again as a kid in this world that you've got this dog who is doing these these strange things and nobody can figure out at least charlie brown is the one who's who's obsessed with seeing these footballs being moved around with with no particular explanation that there's some mystery and stoopy's having the the joy of creating the mystery yeah. it's it's a really fun vivid sequence that i i love it's it's showing a transformation in snoopy a little bit because up until this point, all his fantasizing is about being an animal. Except for, I think he, there was like a, it wasn't a Joe Cool reference, but it was like. Yeah, hanging on the street corner. Hanging on the street corner. And then getting into the 60s, it's more like a, a people. Mm. He's, he's. Yeah. He, you know, the flying ace and all that. He's not, he's getting beyond, I want to be a different animal. He's getting yeah. on to, I want to be a human. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And he's enjoying outwitting the kids and yeah, it's a, uh, anyway, it's, yeah, it's fun. I, I really, for some reason, this really s- strikes me as, as class classic golden age Snoopy where he's, he's, uh, he's affecting their world is he's, yeah, he's not just dreaming something up. He's dreaming something up, creating a character, but then the kids are actually affected by what he's doing. Absolutely. 
And that brings us to an end to 1960. Uh, listen, we Michael had an idea that uh, we were going to add another quick segment here at the end of every year, uh, which is the MVP, Most Valuable Peanut. So, and, and leaving aside, we're, I'm, we won't do anything cutesy and conceptual and, and include Schultz, but of the actual pen and ink characters in Peanuts. Guys, who do you think who do you think gets the call for most valuable peanut 1960? I would say Linus. I might mm. say that every year, <laughs> but I think it's it's a close one between Linus and Lucy. And, and you notice out of the ones we pick, Linus is I think by far the most prevalent character. Yeah, I have to give it to Linus as well. There there's some really cool things with Snoopy that continue to develop, but yeah, Linus is the one that really stands out for me. Um, I'm going to go with Snoopy just because I want to be different. And, uh, you know, there's some big stuff going on with Snoopy this year. Uh, yeah, I'm going to pick Snoopy as my most valuable peanut. And guys, if you're out there listening and you want to let us know who your most valuable peanut is for 1960, you can check us out on our social media. We're Unpack Peanuts on both Instagram and Twitter. You can also log on to our website, unpackingpeanuts.com, and you can vote on Strip of the Year. You can find uh, transcripts from past episodes. You can catch up on past episodes. You could buy us some mud pie. You know these uh, these uh, shows don't edit themselves. So uh, if you could if you could throw in uh, fifty cents for a mud pie or a, or a root beer, we'd much appreciate it. Other than that, that just leaves uh, the last thing, which is guys, what is your pick for strip of the year nineteen sixty? Well, as much as I hate to agree with Harold, <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to agree with Harold on this, and that's the the clouds, the ducky, and the horsey. A classic, Harold. Is that what you're going to say is your pick of the year? Yeah, I I, th- I had said in the William Pepper one that maybe this was the best strip ever uh, from Peanuts. So I'm going to have to certainly <laughs> choose it for this <laughs> year. And uh, I'll just throw in one little last piece of trivia. Um, I noticed in the very last panel here, this is for nothing. Um, one thing that Charles Schultz on the lettering side did is he often would close the G's where the you know, you draw the little loop and then you bring it in against the uh, the in, inner side of the curve of the G. And he, he often would actually take it all the way till it hit the curve of the G, which is generally a no-no, right? In lettering, comics lettering mm-hmm. in the traditional sense. And he does do that in this strip. Um, I, when I was at the Columbus Peanuts, uh, Charles Schultz exhibition that's going on right now at the Billy Ireland Museum, one thing I noticed on one of the originals that they had, which I thought was interesting, there was blue pencil above a oh. 19, probably a mid 1950s strip. And Schultz had done one of these G's where he closes the gap between that straight line and, and it goes all the way into the curve. And you see a little blue pencil mark taking you down to that G. And then you see an exacto knife scraping away at the strip. I'm thinking somebody at United Features uh, went in and, and messed with a Charles Schultz strip. And years later, they don't do it anymore. <laughs> so uh, I'm guessing he caught wind when he got his strips back and he, he let them let them know that uh, you don't mess with uh, any lines I, I lay down here. Well, well done, Charles Schultz. Uh, they shouldn't be messing with your work. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pick March 20th, which is my sister is going to grow from a baby to a well-adjusted child, to which Linus replies, like her brother, <laughs> just because that is one of the all-time great zingers. And I'm going to give just a, this is a, oh, since we have, um, since you guys are both sharing, this I'm going to do this, so I'm going to pick two. I'm going to also Ooh. do... Uh, how pompous can you get, which is the library card. And the reason, yes. the reason I'm going to do that is because uh, without you find librarians out there, I would not have a career. <laughs> Isn't it national library week? Well, not when we're releasing this, whenever that will be. Well, in the moment we're living in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Happy national library week, wherever you are. If Every I'm week. Right. Whenever is national that is. library week. Exactly. And, and regardless of what nation you're in. <laughs> all right so guys uh this was 1960 
as always, this is just an absolute thrill for me. I love hanging out with my pals, uh, talking about my favorite thing in the world, which is cartooning, and my favorite cartooning in the world, which is Charles Schultz's cartooning on Peanuts. We're going to be back next week with 1961, where things are going to continue to sing along at this super high level of, of fun and creativity. And I really hope uh, that you join us, because if, if you're not here, it just won't be the same. Until then. I'm Jimmy from Michael and Harold. Be of good cheer. Yes, Yes, be be of of good good cheer. cheer. Unpacking Peanuts is copyright Jimmy Gownley, Michael Cohen, and Harold Buckholtz. Produced and edited by Liz Sumner. Music by Michael Cohen. Additional voiceover by Aziza Shakrala Clark. For more from the show, follow Unpack Peanuts on Instagram and Twitter. For more about Jimmy, Michael, and Harold, visit unpackingpeanuts.com. Have a wonderful day, and thanks for listening. You blockhead!